Uh, praise God. Selah, I was sitting back there in the back one day before service, and Selah came back and said she was going to be in a talent contest at her school, I believe it was. I said, oh, really, what are you going to do? And she said, well, I'm going to sing. I, and I really had never heard her sing. I was just, you know, moved her off a little bit. I said, what are you going to sing? She told me, I said, what did you sing it for? And she sang the song, and she said, and she sang it, and I'm sitting there, I'm like, really? <laughs> and uh, she said, what do you think? And I said, well, it's simple. I gave a really good pastoral advice. I said, if you don't want that contest, the contest is bogus. <laughs> and uh, I didn't really teach you that in Bible school, but that was my favorite. <laughs> and, uh, and I was very surprised. I didn't know she really sang. And she sang in church a couple times. I think, well, I think there's a calling on your life there. Yeah, yeah there's an anointing there for her to sing for the Lord. We're going to go to Acts chapter 13 tonight. And uh, years ago, my dad had an odd way of teaching me things. And, uh, he was kind of the real old school, military type of mentality. And I remember me and him had a discussion one day about whether or not I knew how to swim. And he was very insistent that I knew how to swim. I'm like, no, I really don't know how to swim. Oh, well, yeah, you do know how to swim. So he wouldn't want to prove his point, so he let me swim. And I wasn't very old, and he had me on the back and on the shoulder, and he just swam up the middle of the lake, threw me off, and said, see you later, and swam back to the floor. <laughs> and um, that was his way of teaching me how to swim. And I did find out I could swim. That's the only time in my life I swam really fast. And uh, I did find out the proper motivation, I could swim. Now, I'm not advising you to do that, as swimming, swimming lessons for anybody, but that's how my dad taught me to swim. Uh, I remember my dad teaching me how to how to play baseball. What little he taught me about that. He gave me a baseball mitt, had me stand up against rocks, and threw the ball in my head. And I learned how to catch. And I found that I could catch a baseball. And that was my dad's odd way of teaching me anything he ever taught me. Was you know, you either swim or you die. I guess I don't know, but uh, I'm sure he wouldn't actually let me perish there. But I, at the time, I believed he would. And I was fully convinced that he wasn't coming back for me no matter what. And uh, the reason I bring that up, because quite honestly, I feel like my Heavenly Father was kind of doing that too tonight. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the and the last conference, and I believe it was a conference before that, when I talked to the Lord about what he wanted me to share, he took me to something that was just a million miles outside of my comfort zone. And he's kind of really done that. I'm going to share something with you tonight. And I'll be honest, I've never taught anything along this line. I've never preached along this line. I've been doing this now for a lot of years, 32, almost 33 years. And I thought I preached and taught about every kind of message I could until he started to put this together and put this on my heart. And I guess it, in some ways, it's as much of a, a sharing, a testimony, sharing maybe the things that I've been through, where God's brought me to for that purpose. And, and as I'm growing in understanding of some things that the Lord has done in my life, and that I believe he's doing prophetically today in the church. And I don't consider myself to be a prophet or anything like that, but well, I'm going to share something with you tonight that I believe is very prophetic for the time that the church is in. And uh, Joe asked me when I came in what the title of my sermon was. I normally don't have titles. And I told him, I said, well, this is easy. The birth of, glor birth of the glorious church. The birth of the glorious church, which I guess his spell correction wouldn't accept that, but... That's what I'm going to attempt tonight to share with you some things that the Lord has basically been showing me and sharing with me as of lately on how the glorious church is birthed. And in River of Life, I've been teaching through the book of Ephesians and with that theme, the glorious church. And for quite some time now, I've, I've really, you know, I, I've always preached about revival, talked about revival. That's always been the burden on my heart. And we understand and believe that God's going to show us a, a, a great revival of time of harvest as this age winds down. And we know that the scripture talks about a glorious church that, that Jesus is going to come from. Well, the thing I've always wondered is how is that going to happen? How are we going to get from where we're at now to where we see the glorious church? And that's one of the things I've been, you know, seeking the Lord about the last, oh, several months possibly, but it, up in the last year, just something that's been a burden on my heart. Lord, how would that happen? You know, I've heard all the, the man-made answers, all the descriptions, but I'm going to be honest, we're not there. Yeah. But I believe we're headed there. Yes. And I believe we're a lot closer than we might believe. Yeah. 
And I believe we're almost right ready for the glorious church to be birthed upon this planet and for this planet to see the glory of God manifest like it's never seen before and God to sweep across this planet and see the greatest harvest that there's ever been. Amen. But I think that we also need to have some understanding about how that will happen and how that will take place. Yes. And I'm going to try to share a little bit with that, about that with you tonight. And like I said, it's really a different type of teaching or preaching than I've ever done in my life, so kind of bear with me, I guess. Uh, but Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 12, is the body of scriptures that I will be uh, digging into. And as I began, as the Lord put this on my heart a few weeks ago, and I went to Acts 13, and I just, I studied it, went to the normal procedure, I went to preparing a teaching, and it just wasn't there. And I knew what had been on my heart, and I'm thinking, Lord, I don't see that in there. You know, I knew where the Lord was leading me. But I'm going to share with you, along that line, what the Lord has shared with me about it. And we're going to begin in verse 1, a very simple phrase that we're going to dig into just a little bit. Now, there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manian, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Now, then there was the church... At Antioch. And right there is where we're going to start at. There was a church at Antioch. Yes. And what we're going to look at tonight a little bit is the birth process of that church at Antioch. And to see how God put that church together. And we're going to look at that and understand that in the context of the birth of the glorious church. And how I believe the Lord has shown me we're going to see that manifest. And I believe very soon, I believe we're right in the process of it. I believe we're much closer than, the, than we might ever have thought. And right there, you know, a lot of people, you go back and you dig into scriptures here a little bit. And a lot of people, will, you know, the scriptures very plainly connect the birth of the church at Antioch with the persecution that broke loose right after the death of Stephen. And, you know, we see that very plainly in the scriptures. It says because of the persecution that the believers were, were scattered abroad. And that they were scattered abroad even as far as Antioch. Now, a lot of people will try to tell us that the, the church in Jerusalem at that time had just grown complacent and grown lazy. So God, you know, God used persecution to spread them out and to stir up evangelism. Well, I don't believe that. You know, I think Mark chapter 4 very plainly tells us that the purpose of persecution is to attack the Word of God. Yeah. I mean, it's very simple. The, the parable of the sower, we know that the Word is sown in the, in, the, in the soil, and what happens immediately, the enemy comes up, and one of the things he uses to attack the Word of God is persecution. So God's not using persecution to spread the gospel. It's, you know, and they say, well, the, the, the church, had, they just had really grown lazy, and so God had to do something. So let me ask you this. If you're thinking, that, boy, I need some people to spread the gospel, let's go find some people who are too complacent, too lukewarm, and too lazy to share the gospel in their homeland, and let's make them missionaries. Yeah. That doesn't sound like a very good plan, does it? If they're too lazy to share the gospel there, if they're too complacent to share the gospel there, if they're too lukewarm to share the gospel there, why would God want to scatter bad seed? Right. That wouldn't make a bit of sense, would it? If God's going to send somebody else missionaries, he's going to look at somebody who's Deeper 
than that. It isn't God using persecution to spread the gospel. It's Satan being dumb. Amen. I mean, it's like attacking a plant and wind attacking a plant and spreading seeds. That's all he accomplished here. Beloved, everywhere we go, we are seeds as believers, aren't we? Wherever we get planted, we're a seed planted in that job. We're a seed planted in that community. We're a seed planted in that home. Wherever we go, we are seeds to spread the gospel. Yeah. And that's all that happened here. The wind blew, Satan did a really dumb strategic move, and the gospel is going forth because God's children are being spread out. And it's really noteworthy as we get into Acts chapter 13 that Paul's being sent forth as a missionary. Why is that so noteworthy? Because at the back, at the beginning of the persecution, Paul was the persecutor. Right. So not only is the gospel spread as they're spread out, but we see the persecutor is not the missionary being sent out. <laughs> you know, people always think, you know, well, why was Paul saved? And they, you know, they God just randomly did that on Damascus Road and appeared to appeared to Paul. And, and I, I'm totally convinced that the reason that Paul got saved is because the apostles and disciples were doing what Jesus had taught them. What did he teach them to do? Pray for their enemies. And so Paul was their enemy. He was their persecutor. They began to pray for him. Jesus responded to their prayers. Jesus showed up to him on Damascus Road. He had this glorious vision, this glorious light. He hears the voice of Jesus Christ. He surrenders his life right there because God's people had been praying for their enemies. Now in the time now we live, that ought to sound familiar because how many testimonies have you heard of Muslims who had a vision of Jesus coming to them and they came to Jesus Christ as a result of that? Our prayers are powerful, beloved. Yes. And when you say pray for your enemies, people try to make that, well, just pray for your enemies. That way your heart's going to be at peace. Pray for your enemies to get saved so they're not your enemies no more. Right. It's what he's trying to get across to us just like the Apostle Paul did. So you see, beloved, we see some really dynamic things happening here. We get into Acts chapter 11, and you can look back there if you want, verse 21. And it says, And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Now something I want us to know here. There was an ingathering of souls. Yes. God's hand was with them, and a great number believed. At that point in time, Barnabas goes against Paul. And then they come back, and they teach for a year. And then after they teach for a year, then the prophets come in. So we see something there. I see a pattern there. There's an ingathering of souls. There's establishing with teaching. And then come the prophets for activation. See, there's a real pattern there. Because one of the things when Agabus comes in and the other prophets come in is there's a prophecy that goes forth. And when that prophecy goes forth that there's going to be a great famine, then they give so to, to those who are going to be in time of need at that. Now let me ask you a simple question. Do you think when, if Barnabas and Paul was teaching for that year that he might have been teaching them something about giving? Do you think he might have been teaching them about seed time and harvest time? Do you think those teachers might have laid a foundation there? And when that foundation was laid there, and then the prophets came in, and the prophets activated something that they had already been laid out, they had already been prepared, and told them kind of, here's how you're going to put this into action. And they did that action, and then they seen the manifestation. Yep. You think that might sound like a conference, don't it? Like, we might have teaching during this week, and each night have some teaching and have the word shared, and then we might have a prophetess come in Sunday night and do some activa activation and see some miraculous things happen in your life. Yes. Yes. See, there's a pattern there that God laid out. Yes. And there's a key there that we need to understand that I'm going to get into in just a moment. But that pattern is very, very, very plainly and simply laid out. Now, the key thing we have to understand here in the book of Acts is we see the five-fold ministry working together. We see evangelism. We need teaching. We see teaching establishing. And we see the prophetic activating. That's very key. Like I share with River of Life all the time. They always give me, they still give me those muscle looks. I say, I can't equip you guys. I can do my part. But God said he sent apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints, yeah. for the work of the ministry. Yeah. 
Yeah. I can do my part. Yes. But I am not sent to equip people all by myself. God meant for the fivefold ministry to be working together in harmony, in unity, with the same goals and the same focus. That's good. Yes. Now something has happened in the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. oh, yes. One of the things that I've been, been praying about, me and Rachel talk about this a lot in the last few months, is, is lack of manifestation of the promises of God in people's lives. I mean, if we're honest, we're not seeing, you know, we know what the Word says. We know what the Word promises. And we see manifestation, but we all know we should be seeing a lot more manifestation. Yeah, yeah. Amen? Yeah. I mean, I don't care where people come from. I said about the other day, I'm going to give this a little bit of class. I mean, I, you know, there's all kinds of churches out here. They'll all agree with you on that. They'll all agree that, you know what, we're not seeing a manifestation of what God promises in the Word. Now, they'll have different answers. Why? But you see, one of the things I, I, I'm coming to believe very strongly <laughs> is that one of the reasons we're not seeing the manifestations in some cases is because we splintered the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. And we can't do it by ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to share that with you. For example, in, in, in churches, one of the things that churches will do, churches will kind of gather around specific gifting. I mean, there are churches that are very prophetic. In other words, they, their services, they have a, a lot of worship, and they pray, and they're fasting, and they're always seeking the move of the Holy Spirit and the voice of God. And that's great. Because I describe myself. I think that's great. Um, there's other churches that are very focused on teaching. In other words, you know, they, they, their services are a little bit different, maybe not as much worship and, and not as much prayer and not as much fasting because they're always looking to teach and lay down a foundation. Um, there are churches that are just strictly evangelism. You know, why do they, they get up and preach? They're preaching how to be saved and giving a salvation message. And what happens is people seem to gather around those churches. Somebody comes in and the church is more prophetic and somebody really geared that way, they go to that church. They go try another church and somebody else comes in and maybe they're looking for the teaching. They say, well, that's a good church, but that's not for me. And so they find them where the gift of teaching is strong and they gather around that group. Somebody has a, a real burden for the evangelism. Is they go in and they find that church is all about the salvation message and, and, and going out in the streets and witnessing. They naturally gather to that church. And so we have a group over here who's, who's maybe really prophetic and they're praying and fasting and, and, and listening to the, to the voice of God and, and all kinds of people like that gather. And, and, and maybe they have different people come in and maybe a teacher comes in and the pastor says, well, that was good teaching, but my church didn't respond that well to it. Because they're always looking for that that they're inclined toward. Right. The other church maybe they're always having the teaching and, and then somebody comes in who's very prophetic and they say, well, that's good, I know that's of God, but my people didn't respond that good to it. And so on and so forth. The, the church is all evangelism. Boy, somebody comes in and they really beat them up until they need to get out and witness. Boy, boy, I love that guy. We all seem to gather around in groups that are geared toward what we're looking for or where our gifting leans toward. Now, where that comes into problems is there's, in the prophetic group over here, this church over here, there's people who, they will use the example of healing, they need to be healed, and they're not receiving healing. Now, over here in the teaching group, there's people who need to be healed, but they know what is there, but they're not seeing the manifestation. And there's people over here in the evangelistic group who need to be healed, but they're not seeing the manifestation. And, and I'm convinced one of the reasons why in some of those cases is this person over here, when they come and they're, they, they go to the pastor, the, the church leaders, and, and they say, boy, I've got this affliction on me, and I know God, you know, by his stripes I'm healed, and all of that, they say, well, we need to pray and fast and hear from God and get a word for you. Well, that's great. But maybe that person needs teaching. Then the person in the teaching church who comes to them and says, says, says you know, I, I've got this affliction. I, I, I need to see, I know what the word says. I need to see manifestation. Well, we need to get you more teaching. But maybe they need 
a word of activation from the prophet. But then you go over here in this group and somebody needs healing, they, they go to pass it. Well, you know, I mean, that, that, that's okay, but you know, we're going out to offer souls. That's all that really matters. You see, because of the splinter, people aren't receiving in many cases what they need to receive. And we've got it in groups and we're all protecting it. And we've got the pastor over here protecting it against the people over here. And the press over here, we're all standing guard making sure nobody else gets in. <laughs> and we've been warned about false teaching. And that prophetic group over there, they get crazy at night. <laughs> I was at it, I was funny talking. I, I just got part of it. I was at lunch today. I was like, I think it was a 700 club. They were giving testimonies. She'd grown up in a certain circle that, that didn't believe much in the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Said, so, you know, she said, I just thought the Holy Spirit was crazy when everybody talked about it. But you see, beloved, there's a lack of manifestation many times, I believe, because we're in splintered groups. And we're not receiving from apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Because sometimes you need to hear from an apostle. Sometimes you need to hear from a prophet. Sometimes you need to hear from an evangelist. Sometimes you need a pastor. Sometimes you need a teacher. But no one of them is ever sufficient. That's right. You see, this all has to do with the Lord's church. Go to Ephesians chapter 5. You can cheat me on this just a second. I gotta help myself. Let me read this real quick. I'm gonna to have to backtrack. Then we're gonna get back to there with a little bit more scores. Because this is something I kind of gotta do kind of systematically here. I'm not really a systematic teacher. Ephesians chapter 5. I'm not prophetic guy. Uh, verse 26 and 27. I, I got to establish something here real quick. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the worship of water by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy without blemish. Now, I want you to notice something real quick before we go on farther. How, how it becomes the glorious church. The word is very specific on this. You know, I, I shared with this when I was teaching, and I've been teaching through the book of Ephesians. A lot of people say, well, the church is going to go through the tribulation to get them ready for the rapture. It, don't, it doesn't say that. Well, the church just needs to go through, just, you know, persecution. It doesn't say that. Church needs to go through something. It doesn't say that. It's very specific here. We know exactly how the church becomes the glorious church by the worship of the water of the word. Amen? Amen. Amen. By the worship of the water of the word. That I would define as what we would refer to as revelation knowledge. What we would refer to as rhema. It's the anointed word of God. The water of the word is the anointed Amen. word of God. Amen. Now I want to take a moment and I want to share with you a process. We come to Christ, and I'm going to use myself, and I'm going to get into it a little bit more here in a minute, but when we come to Christ, <coughs> we're born again. There's certain things we believe in. That are wrong. Right? I mean, you know, I believe all kinds of crazy stuff when I got saved. I had all kinds of crazy ideas. Why? Because it was just based on my thinking, my carnal mind. I didn't know anything about the Word of God. So obviously my thinking wasn't right. And throughout the years, I've been going through a process where I'm washed by the water of the Word. Where anointed teaching anointed preaching, receiving revelation knowledge, receiving rhema from God, tears down some of the stuff inside of me that I, that I believe that was wrong, and replaces that with things that I believe is right. Now, at times that's a tremendous struggle. Right. At times that's a tremendous battle. I mean, there's been things that I have fought for years inside of me that were wrong beliefs, 
But yet it's taken God years to really tear that stronghold down in me. You know, I'll be honest, prosperity was one of them. When I got born again, I had as much of a prosperity mindset as anybody on the planet. Due to the fact of the lifestyle I had came up, due to the fact of the home life I had raised in, I didn't know anything but poverty. And I thought that's what life was. And then I was born again, and lo and behold, there's the body of Christ, the church began to reinforce my idea of poverty. And so I had that pretty well rounded in me. And then I come to the Word of God, and I begin to study the Word of God. I begin to listen to some people saying otherwise. And it was a tremendous battle on the inside of my to tear down those old strongholds that were placed in me by the past life I had lived and by false ideas put in my mind and a false understanding of prosperity and what it was for. So it's not just, okay, this is what the Word says. Because we go through battles, don't we? Yeah. We go through struggles in those areas. You know, one of the areas I, I went through is understanding grace. I was very legalistic as a young believer. I mean, you know, if you had a wrong thought, you lost your salvation. And, and I was miserable. So there was a process I had to go through where God's word and God's spirit tore down those false beliefs and replaced them with revelation knowledge of God's word. So keep that process in mind. Because what I'm going to share with you on the birth of the glorious church is going to be understood on the basis of what I just described to you. By the worship of the water of the word. You see, as we get on in Ephesians, and I'm not on Ephesians, but the Bible tells us, <coughs> Ephesians says that the body is to be fitly joined together. Well, I would read those verses and think, Lord, how's that going to happen? I mean, how's it fitly going to be joined together? How can that take place? And it goes on and talks about us being one body. You know, we don't talk about the bodies of Christ. We talk about the body of Christ. We have one Lord. We have one Father. We have one Spirit on the inside of us. And see, there's all kinds of reasons that the book of Ephesians talks to us about that and says that, you know, we're to be together and united. Now, a little bit more about my when I was born again, I went through three key areas that I see in my life, three key stages. When I was born again, I became involved and was discipled by a pastor in a Wesleyan church. And so I learned a lot about Wesleyan teaching, and Wesleyan theology. And that gentleman helped me a great deal of life. I was always one to dig into the Word. I was always one to study the Word. I was always one that I, you know, I didn't accept what people said. I started saying, well, that's just what it is. I go to this church and I don't believe that. I had to find out the Word of God. And as I began to get into the Word of God, I realized that there were some things that I was receiving from the Lord by His Word. I was being forced by the water of the Word that were contrary to what that church was teaching me. That church was very much opposed to the gifts of the Spirit. That church was very much opposed to the idea of the baptism of the Holy Spirit in the sense of the evidence of speaking in tongues. So as I dug and I dug and I dug, and again, that was a battle going on inside of me in my life. Because I had some people in my life who, who warned me, don't mess with that stuff. But I had other people tell me, you've got to have that. And so I'm going to the Word. I'm digging into the Word of God. What's true? Right. And, and when I say that, I'm not talking about I just don't want the Bible read it once. I went through a season in my life of digging into the Word of God, studying the Word of God, praying and seeking God on that. And I can remember back very clearly at times in my life, one time I remember I was cutting my grandfather's grass when I was riding a lawnmower, and I'd been studying that, and I'm praying, and I'm talking to the Lord, and boom, I mean, the, the anointing just hit me and began to just speak to me and reveal to me about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't too long after that that I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In the backseat of the car, one down Interstate 74. <laughs> I thought I was being raptured. I did, seriously. I thought, I'm going to it. it is. But that's that process. 
the worship of the water of the word. And so then we kind of part of the ways, I, and not in a bad way with that pastor, I still have conversations with him on occasion in Facebook. He doesn't live in this area anymore. Uh, so then I started going to the, what we would consider more the, the conventional Pentecostal churches. And I, I met this Baptist preacher. This, I love this story. This always cracks me up. And this Baptist preacher, because for some reason he decided he wanted to give me a gift. So he went into a bookstore and he told me, he says, I've got this friend who's Pentecostal. And I'm going to buy him a Pentecostal book. What would you suggest? And they took him and showed him and he bought a Kenneth Hagin book. Mm -hmm. Understanding the anointing. <laughs> and he brought that to me. And he said, I just want to give you a gift. He said, this sounds like a good one for a Pentecostal. And he gave me that book. <laughs> I didn't really know anything at all about Kenneth Hagin. I had heard the name, didn't know the first thing about it. But I sat down and I read that book and the Holy Spirit about knocked me on my chair. <laughs> I was okay, there's something here I need to find out about. And so I began to read his materials and study his materials, and I began to learn from him about a life of faith and how I can receive from things from God by faith. And again, there was some of the stuff he was saying was going against some of the stuff I believed. And so there was that process, and there was that battle taking place in my life, being forced by the water of the world. You see, that process is very important for us to understand. That process is very key to understanding what I'm trying to share with you. And it became a very personal conflict in my life. And because I looked at those that I had known in, in the Wesleyan circles, and they sure didn't help me a lot. And there were things in their group that I knew was a God. And I looked at those that were more the conventional Pentecostal, and I knew that they had taught me a lot. And there was a lot there that was God. You know, I didn't have this horror stories like a lot of pastors, and everybody abused me along the way. I think it really didn't happen. Then I got into the faith circles, and, and I realized how much I was learning there that I didn't learn anywhere else. And what really threw me was the Wesleyan people, not the Pentecostals and the faith people. And then you get into the Pentecostal groups, and they knock the faith people and the Wesleyan people. Then you get into the faith people, and they knock them both. And that became a real problem in my life. It became a true struggle. And I, and I felt like, I, you know, I don't know, you teenagers, you either have like two or three friends, and they didn't like each other. So you couldn't hang out with them all together. You know, you can't never have all your friends together because they fight. But that's what I felt like. I had three good friends, but I couldn't ever hang out with them at the same time because they know them. Each other. <laughs> and the bad part was they were living on the inside of me now. <laughs> but there's truth in all of it. <clears throat> there's word in all of it. There's revelation. We have run into is the Wesleyan group over there. I'm not taking a lesson. They're over here and they're standing guard. They're not going to let any damn Pentecostal stuff get in their camp. <laughs> they're certainly not going to let none of that faith stuff get in their camp. <laughs> Pentecostal, they're over here. They're standing guard. They're not going to let none of that Wesleyan stuff get in there. They're not going to let none of these faith people in there. And then people here, they're standing guard. And so now we again, we not only have another splinter group because there's people over here in the West End group who the Pentecostals can teach them a whole lot about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the anointing. There's people over here in the faith group that can teach them a whole lot about walking by faith, but they're so afraid of them, they're not going to listen to them. And you have that in all the groups. <laughs> You see, beloved, the glorious church can't be a splintered bunch of people who are afraid of each other. It can't happen that way. So how do we get from where we are to there? I'm going to share something with you. We go back 
in church history. And we can see where God has brought forth or restored certain truths over the years. I mean, you know, we go back and, you know, we can see where he brought forth, you know, salvation by faith and faith alone. We can see where he brought forth in what we call the holiness movement, the message of holiness. We can go forth and see where he brought forth in the Pentecostal revival referred to, and he brought forth the, the revelation and the understanding about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We can look into what we call the charismatic revival, and he brought forth a lot of understanding about the gifts of the Spirit. We can look into the, the, the faith revival that we call it, where he, he brought forth and gave us great understanding about how to walk by faith and, and, and brought forth the teaching ministry and our authority in Christ and all of that. We can see where God did that. And we can see in the time we live where he's bringing forth the prophetic and the apostolic. But beloved, what has gone wrong is some way back then when God brought forth the revelation of salvation by faith, there's a people that built camp around that. That's what we believe is God, nothing else after that. Then we get in the holiness movement, and that was God, but nothing else after that. So they got a camp. Then you get into the Pentecostals and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, well, they got a camp, nothing after that. And we go right on down the line, and everybody who receives some kind of revelation or understanding of something, they think they're supposed to start a denomination with it. And we've got people splintered and divided all over the place. Yes, yes. And then the word says that Jesus is going to come for a glorious church without spot or wrinkle who are walking in the fullness of his power and the fullness of his glory. Lord have mercy, how can that happen? Mm. I'm going to share something with you. How the Lord has shown me something. Rachel, can you turn to Psalm 133? Use an illustration here. Understand the process. I could, I'm going to ask you guys something for some help here. You got some pastors in the house. Some apostles. Pastor Tim, Pastor Bob, Pastor Lorenzo, could you guys come here? Maybe I'll help her for just a moment. I don't, I, I don't really want to share this other than to illustrate. It's on 133. Yeah. I just remember, I just taught you about the process. And I used myself as an example. I started with the Wesleyan and went to Pentecostal groups and in the faith group. And all along the way, I'm, I'm, I'm having these battles with the Word of God. I'm having the battles where I'm receiving revelation about stuff that maybe is different than what I thought or I had been taught. And so I'm going through this process where I'm having to lay things down. I'm having to take on new truths, new understanding of God's word. Not new truths in the sense that it didn't exist before, but new truths to me in my life. And so after I was born again, my life has been a process of receiving and digesting and laying down and taking on and receiving and laying down and taking on and receiving and laying down and taking on. And the word says that the glorious church is going to come by the washing of the water of the word, which I'm describing to you that process of receiving from God and, 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 and revelation knowledge and moving forward in the things of God and obtaining some things from God, some understanding of God and revelation of God. We understand that now? We've got to understand that process. Yes. Because you see, the, 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 the thing of it is, I, I have never asked this guy that question, but well, I bet Pastor Tim's went through that process. I bet Pastor Bob's went through that process. I bet Pastor Lorenzo has went through that process. I bet they're going through that process. I, I, would, I would venture to say this, not to be real prophetic, but I would venture to say that they would probably tell you that that process, as of lately, seems to have really accelerated. That it's, something's happening here. I mean, I'm getting revelation, I'm changing so fast, it almost scares me. <laughs> What's happening? 
You see, because there's a people that are being forced by the law of the word and the seas that we live. And what's happening is we're, we're, we're letting down those walls. We're letting down those barriers. And God is taking a people who are digging into his word and listening to his spirit. And he's accelerating that process. Because as we're going through that process, on the other side of the coin, and this is what the Lord has showed me, on the other side of this coin, there's an anointing. Yes, yes, yes. And that anointing comes when there's wholeness and the body of Christ is fitly joined together and we're all going through that process and we're all being fitly joined together and fitly put together and there's anointing coming upon a people <coughs> who have went through that process and being prepared by the word of God and being prepared by the spirit of God and one day we're all going to look up and we're going to know one another not because we've been in the same organization not because we've been in the same denomination we're going to know one another because we're going to recognize on each other, a revival anointing that's a lot of new people who are raised up across this planet in the United States and all across this planet going through the same process right now, accelerated and rushing and rushing and rushing, becoming the glorious church in our hearts and in our thinking and our lives and being prepared one day that that anointing of that glorious church comes upon our life and we look around and we see one another and we say, there it is. There it is. There it is. Now there are going to be many who won't go through this. There'll be many who want to stay in the camps. And won't ever receive anything from the Word. Won't ever receive anything from the Holy Spirit. They're just going to stay in their camps. Forget that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, and I have a laser. I'll show you. You guys can compare with this set. Great song. Hey, now here, here's what I believe the, the, the anointing for the glorious church comes. Read Psalm 133. Wow. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garment. It is like the dew of Hermon, descending upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Now it talks about an anointing, a special kind of anointing that comes upon unity. Yes. And I have to ask you, when does that ever happen? Mm. It never has happened, has it? Yes. We haven't seen that happen. Mm -hmm. You see, when, when, when we go through that process, and Pastor Tim's been through that process, Pastor Bob's been through that process, Pastor Lorenzo's been through that process, and we run into one day, one day we look at and we wait a second. I see that anointing from Pastor Tim. I see that anointing from Pastor Bob. I see that anointing from Lorenzo. These are revival people in the last days. You see, then it's very easy for us to join hands. And we enjoyed hands in one heart, one mind, one heart. And we love it. Glory to God. This comes the anointing upon the glorious church. Not because we're some organization or some denomination. We can do the process. And we are the anointed people for the last days of the Bible. And we join hands. And we hold the glorious church. Hallelujah. Glory to God. That is the birth now. And the womb from which comes the glorious church. And how it happens in our time and in our age.
Acts 13, verse 2. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. But just real quick, and I want to kind of apply this to what we're doing. The Holy Ghost said. Now, that implies a relationship. We understand that. That implies a relationship with the Holy Spirit, doesn't it? It's like in Acts chapter 15. <coughs> Acts chapter 15, they, they had this meeting and they were trying to work out some issues in the church there in Jerusalem. And, and they came forth and they said, it seems good to us and the Holy Spirit. So we understand that relationship there. Now we understand also that the way Jesus operated was for relationship, wasn't it? Jesus had a relationship with his Father. And Jesus was often prayer. And I said, what's he praying about all night? It's just a relationship with his Father. And John 5, 9, 5, 19 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the Father do. Another place he tells us that he makes his decisions by what he hears from the Father. And then he went on and taught the disciples through relationship, didn't he? And you know, that's back then. That was common. We understood that when they taught. You know, the, the father who was the farmer taught the sons how to farm and so on and so forth. Or whatever their trade was, they, they worked beside one another and taught one another. We did that in the United States up until probably my grandfather's generation. You know, that's how he worked. By whatever he did, he worked on the farm with his father. They, through relationship, they learned how they worked. And so Jesus taught the disciples that way, didn't he? I mean, he was always stopping what he was doing and making an object lesson out of it, like the fig tree. And he taught them that they believe in their heart, don't doubt, and speak unto the, they can do the same thing. But they couldn't cast a demon out of the kid, and out of the, out of the kid, and they came, and Jesus used that as an object lesson to teach them about their faith. And so we find Jesus always using that way of teaching somebody, that way of sharing things with them. And, uh, and that's important when we look at this, because the one thing I want to go to John chapter 14, verse 16. And, and this is just a couple of quick points to kind of tie this up. John chapter 14, verse 16. Hallelujah. It says, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. So, I, I use an illustration, and, and probably most of you here who are from River of Life have heard it probably more than once, in describing another. And I use the example of a car. And imagine that I might write you a pink Ferrari. And one day I ask you, can I borrow your pink Ferrari? I mean, it's pink, but it is a Ferrari. <laughs> and I want to see what, how what it feels like. They go really fast. And uh, so I brought a big Ferrari and I have an accident. So I go back and I tell you, oh, I'm sorry, but you know, I don't have your pink Ferrari, but don't worry, be confident. I'm going to buy you another one. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to get you another one tomorrow. And so tomorrow I show up with the Ford Taurus. <laughs> it's another one, it's another car. Right? I didn't know I brought her another car. No. <laughs> That's one way it could be another one. Now, the other way that it could be another one is I could show up the next day with the exact car, a pink Ferrari, that it looked exactly like the one I had. See, there's two ways it could be another. Another exactly like it or another that's in type. This is another exactly like it. This is a pink Ferrari. And the reason I bring that point up, because when, it, when we look at how Jesus ministered, then we can understand that so likewise shall the Holy Spirit minister. And sometimes when we look at these things, we think, well, you know, we look at Jesus, and, and Jesus, you know, told the man with the withered hand, stretch forth your hand. And he did it, and he was healed. He told a, a criminal man, just nice on the wall. And, and the one important, Jesus was constantly giving some kind of instructions that led people into the miraculous. And he says, I'm going to send you another carpenter who will do just like I do. And so the Holy Ghost said here is sending them forth, and they're about to see a miraculous explosion of growth in that church. You see, beloved, to step into the supernatural. To step into the miraculous of God. 
the glorious church will have to function on a Holy Ghost Sabbath. It will have to be a relationship. Because the same way that Jesus was leading them and guiding them and directing them to relationship, we will, be, we will function through relationship with the Holy Spirit. Just like this. I'm sorry, but they didn't take a moment. They didn't have a, a mission board. <coughs> the Holy Ghost said. And that applies very much to our life. And, and, and you know, I, I bring that up not just to make that point, but, but one of the things that, you know, as I prayed about this conference that the Lord has really put upon my heart is there's going to be some Holy Ghost said. Some people are going to hear the voice of God. Yes. And we're going to heed that and step into that and see the miraculous. But they set the atmosphere, didn't they, with their prayers, their fasting. And I'm saying that to encourage you during these, these evenings. It's, it, it, in, your, in your daily walk, take some time to get before God and listen. When you come into these services, come in here with a heart open to hear the voice of God. To hear a Holy Ghost said. It might be in the worship. It might be in the teaching. It might be in, in prophetic ministry going forth. I mean, there's many ways that happens. But, beloved, we've got to live in anticipation of the voice of God giving us directions. We've got to live in anticipation of the voice of God speaking to us and opening up a door that we step through into the miraculous. And one other thing, I, I do want to bring up this will be my last point. Verses 6 to 8. Not, not to just do a full water on this, but this is the challenge. The Holy Ghost led them right into the heat of the battle. Verses 6 to 8. Let me read that to you. Told to put on. Mm -hmm. 
Now, when God told us to pull on the armor, what do you think he intended us to do? I think he meant we were getting ready to fight. Amen? But, you know, I, and I was challenged with this recently in my own life. I was sitting praying one day, and I thought, Lord, I'm really comfortable. I'm comfortable in what I'm doing. I'm comfortable in my home. But Lord, would it be hard to motivate me to do something different right now? Because I'm pretty comfortable. And, and, and something that brought up on me, you know, we, we dropped the bomb in Afghanistan recently. The mother of all bombs, I guess they refer to it as. And I had several people come to me and tell me, say, you know what? I'm really concerned that our president's going to get us into a war. I says, time out. We are in the world. Yeah. I think the 10,000 guys we have over there fighting and living in, 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 in fear of their life every day probably never thought, boy, if they drop another bomb, we're going to have a war over here. <laughs> <laughs> Why would we think such crazy thoughts? Why? Because we're sitting over here in comfort. And beloved, we forgot how long we've been at war now, 10 years? Why do we forget such stuff? How do we forget that? Because we're living in comfort. And, and I'm a challenge with that thought. Are we living in such comfort and such blessings that maybe we forgot that we're in war? Our faith is a weapon of war. For yes. And we have to check ourselves and check our lives and ask ourselves because, beloved, the glorious church. Is not going to be just sitting around in comfort and luxury. The glorious church will be marching for and the whole God and yeah. taking yeah. captives in the name of Jesus yeah. and bringing in the harvest. Yeah. Amen. So we can shout and we want the glorious church burn. But we've got to understand. You know, and I thought about that and I might have said, I'm going to <laughs> You know, I, I did decide to prepare this message and I was keep writing out all my notes. I've got the process where I was going to make me, oh, my God, this is, this is like a secret. You know, and that's one of the things as a pastor that we get used to just we can just preach a few weeks. You know, I don't have to be all tied up and whatnot. Uh, but I ask myself, you know, Lord, are we discipling people to live comfortable lives? Or are we discipling people to be better soldiers? Yes, amen. And that's a question we've all got to 